It could be a long summer of reruns, reality TV, and, I don't know, maybe reading a book. The TV Writers Union, the Writers Guild of America, is on strike. The contract negotiations failed with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, a group of more than 300 TV and film networks and production companies. That includes Netflix, HBO, and ABC. Members of the Guild say executives refuse to meet key demands for fair wages and job security. Better pay and better writing conditions. They need to be able to support their families, pay their rent, um, have better conditions in the workplace. I came up at a time where we could do that, and I want that for these young people. The middle class of writers has fallen out, and it's become harder for people like me to move up the rungs of um, the entertainment industry. The odds are so stacked against you, and they frankly don't need to be. Studios have pushed back, citing industry-wide budget concerns and recent layoffs at major companies like Disney and Warner Brothers. So what does this mean for the writers who've walked off the job? And how will this play out for those of us watching or not watching at home and on our phones, right? I'm joined now by Patrick Verone, former president of the Writers Guild of America West and an award-winning television writer with dozens of credits, including The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson's, The Simpsons, and Futurama Plus. Narissa Williams Scott, CEO and owner of TCGT Entertainment in Boston, and a member of the communications faculty at Emerson College, and Dominic Patton, senior editor at Deadline, who's been covering the strike. Welcome to all of you. Uh, let's start with you, Dominic. Tell us what the latest is on the strike. Well, I mean, what we're seeing is, and, and our other guests can speak to this as well, I'm sure, you know, we're on day three now of what is clearly looking like potentially a very long strike. You know, I spoke to an executive just when the strike was called by the WGA uh, late on Monday going into Tuesday, becoming efficient, effective, and he said to me he thought this was going to be shorter than 1988, longer than 2008, which of course was 100 days. There's some very big issues here out on the streets of LA and New York. We've been covering the picket lines at the various studios and facilities. In some places, we're seeing now the Teamsters are not crossing certain picket lines, which is a thing they can do in their contract. Individual Teamsters can do that. Very strong words, very strong support. And I will say even more so, and Patrick knows this because he was out. There was a little bit of rain in LA today, and usually rain in LA washes everything away. It seemed to make the picket lines even stronger and louder. Patrick, can you break down for us exactly what it is that you're not getting and why the strike happened? Well, fundamentally, what we didn't get was a conversation on the important issues that uh, we needed to engage with the studios. There, uh, there were several issues that uh, they did engage on, what I would describe as traditional increases to minimums and, and some of our residuals. They, they were able and willing to talk about those things. But there's been a fundamental shift in the way writers have been hired, particularly in streaming over the last half dozen years. And, and that change has resulted in a, in, a, in a change in the way that we feel a structural change needs to happen in the way that we're uh, employed and paid. They didn't want to talk about that at all. And then the other issue that I'm sure your viewers are somewhat and getting more familiar with is, is artificial intelligence and AI. And the Writers Guild has a very strong position that we believe that writing should be done by human beings. And the companies, again, were very resistant to talk about that issue. Narissa, my understanding as a, a layperson and just a viewer on this is that the concerns also are um, when we're watching streaming shows, often there are fewer episodes. So even though maybe in the negotiations in the past, you might have made more money or had a better deal, there are fewer episodes. So in the end, you're, you're making less because the seasons are shorter. And the streaming services, um, you're not necessarily getting the residuals that you might if I'm watching something on broadcast television that Absolutely. is in rerun. Is that true? Absolutely. Um, there are shorter episodes. Now they call it limited series. Um, and so then you have people who only have four episodes as opposed to 13. That's the standard. Um, and when you have that, then what happens when it's on the streaming service and it's watched over and over and over again? And they are able to t determine those analytics. They can tell you how many times someone has watched that show. Are they giving that information to the union? 
Are they telling them your show has been watched 15 times in one hour or 150 times? Because we're talking global here. It's not just here in the United States. And so when you have that, it's being able to determine how many times over how long of a period. Um, normally in broadcast TV, those those episodes would only last for a season and then it would go in another season. And by the time you've hit it five years, okay, in maybe 10 years, you go back to reruns. However, with streamers, it could be ongoing and ongoing and ongoing. And so the writers, I, you know, we're, we're standing with them. They, they deserve to be paid for those. Patrick, some, some people would, would, would argue and push back a little bit and say, you know, Look, at no one knows what's happening with AI. We're all in this this brand new frontier. It's exponentially growing. <laughs> we have no idea when it's going to be like you know hitting us and how it's going to be hitting us. Uh, we're all going through job changes. Uh, NBC's laying off folks. NPR's laying off folks. Um, why is a restriction on some or a, or a hold on 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 some salaries? Why is that out of line? with what's happening in the rest of the industry and other industries? Well, first of all, let, let me analogize what we're doing now regarding AI to uh, what the Writers Guild did in 2007 and 8. When I was president of the Guild and we went on strike for 100 days over what we then called new media, which we now know as streaming. We didn't know what it was going to be. At the time, people thought, well, maybe this will just be like CB radios or something. There wasn't <laughs> there wasn't a business model. There wasn't anything that we could all rely on as saying, this is how we should be paid. This is how we should be uh, employed. And so we had our proposals and the discussions we ultimately had with the studios had to, you know, they, they were they were open ended enough. We ended up getting jurisdiction so that there would be an ongoing dialogue about those conditions. The same thing is happening with AI to the extent that we also don't know how it's going to be used. But we do know because one of the executives negotiating for the company said the quiet part loud that they don't want to restrict themselves from doing or using a technology that they may need in the future. So the implication is they want to be able to use AI and we want to be able to build fences about it. We want to be able to make sure that fundamentally the writing belongs to a human being, that it belongs to a writer, and that that's where the creative force uh, begins. Let's hear from uh, Adam Conover, who's a TV writer and showrunner and host on CNN. He was on CNN Tuesday discussing the discrepancy between what we're talking about and how much executives are making. David Zaslav, the CEO of Warner Brothers Discovery, which is, you know, the parent company of the network I'm talking to you on right now, was paid $250 million last year, a quarter of a billion dollars. That's about the same level as what 10,000 writers are asking him to pay all of us collectively. These companies are making enormous amounts of money. Their profits are going up. It's ridiculous for them to plead poverty. Dominic, this is a great argument, and it would be true for almost every industry. And here in the United States, we don't have a cap on how much CEOs can make. Is, is this an argument that's going to have any legs? I don't think that. I think Adam is making a good comparison, and I think the math is pretty strong, and you can't disagree with it. Look, Patrick, I hope you'll back me up, and I hope your other guests will, too. I don't think anybody disagrees that writers are not being paid enough. Still have an argument out there that, oh my God, look at all the money we're paying now to writers. But that's because there's so many shows, there's so many platforms. So of course your numbers are going up. But when you look at on average what writers are making, what used to be a pathway to a middle class lifestyle, as, we, as you mentioned in the opening segment, that's simply disappearing for the vast majority of WGA members. And look, I'm a journalist, I stand on the fence on this, but the numbers are real. So when you talk about the kind of money here, I'm going to give out an example. Patrick, please correct me if I'm wrong. But the WGA sent out uh, the night that they called the strike some information on where, the, where both sides were in this. Ultimately, what they were looking at was about $429 million overall. The studios were offering $86 million, 48%, by the way, which was simply an increase in minimums. So that's the discrepancy in the money we're talking about. We talk about AI, the, the, the Guild was talking about regulating it, keeping it in the contract, and obviously the human component being primary. The studios, they wanted to have a meeting once a year about new technologies, which I mean, I, I guess means like, look, I bought a new iPhone, I don't know. So this element of this discussion, the studios are always gonna plead poverty. They did it in 2017, they did it in previous ones, they did it in 2008, and yes, 
Disney is cutting 7,000 jobs. Other people are cutting jobs. They're, they're cutting content costs. They're consolidating content costs. But as Adam said in that clip from CNN, again, the numbers don't lie. They are making great profits. If they have made some bad business decisions in terms of streaming and what have you, that's part of capitalism. And I think all of them like being capitalists. The reality is a lot of this is being done by them to keep their stock up, to keep Wall Street hedge fund managers happy. What's actually happening to the people who are creating this content, and again, I stand on the fence, but the reality is they are not making enough money. Patrick knows this as a, a WGA leader, and I'm sure others do too. I know writers that I've spoken to who work on what would be considered hit shows on streaming, and that transparency issue is huge, by the way. They have to get second and maybe third jobs to pay their rent regularly and with mortgages. That is not what we call hooray for Hollywood. Narissa, I want to talk about the other challenge here for um, a number of uh, people who are new to the writer's room, mm -hmm. women, uh, black and brown people, people mm -hmm. representing other constituencies that have not been um, ex uh, uh, allowed to participate mm -hmm. in the writing process or the content mm -hmm. process. Uh, how, what's the feeling within those communities about how this strike would uh, impact? Well, it, 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 it's, as they say, it all rolls downhill. Right. Um, and so when it starts rolling, it's like, OK, do we get out of the way or do we stay where we are? And sometimes, especially we have new voices. We have women of color. We have LGBTQIA. We have so many different shows that are coming down the pike, as we call it, um, that I think it's imperative that people begin to realize that these people who are um, who are representing uh, the predominant uh, class in the WGA, they need to have a voice for the LGBTQI and the BIPOC community. Um, we, we're just starting to get in there, and then all of a sudden, it's a strike. And we all we 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 want to make sure that we we keep with the human factor. Don't forget about the human factor. I think that's what the main argument is, in my opinion, is that we are we're forgetting about people have families. They have lives. They're not asking for the world. They're just asking to be paid a living wage. And I don't see anything wrong with that. That's quite honestly something that we in the LGBTQIA and BIPOC community have been asking for for years. This is this is the lane that we've been in for a very long time, and we're we're happy to join in where they're trying to raise that voice. Absolutely. So, Patrick, to the uh, important question: How does this impact my viewing? Uh, what's going to happen? What am I going to get to watch? You know, before I get to that, I do want to capitalize on what Narissa was saying, that, that the, the, the advent of streaming and the, the, the broadening of both the audience and the, the production facilities to writers of color, uh, BIPOC members of the community, everybody uh, suddenly was, was being invited to a, to a place at the table. Unfortunately, that place at the table was more along the lines of the gig economy that they would only hire you when they needed you, they would only hire you for the time that they needed you, and, and there was a, there's been a real trend within this business of uh, hiring writers of color, women, uh, LGBTQ community members who were uh, entry level and who were hired only because there were requirements to hire those writers. And as they were, uh, as they were joining the community of successful writers, all of a sudden the bar got lifted and there became a separation between people in the writer's room and then writers in production. Because of the method of production for streaming, you write the shows now and then weeks later, sometimes months later, you go into production. And the writers who were in that original room don't necessarily get invited. So you have this new entry level uh, assortment of writers who didn't rise up the ladder. And, and unfortunately, it has been, um, I don't want to say overwhelmingly, but, but inappropriately, uh, pre previously, un, 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 uh, I don't want to say unwelcome, but, you know, writers who hadn't been <laughs> in that that might, that might actually be the word. That's OK. It's right. actually the word. So. I don't want to say. Um, so how does it, but how does it affect your viewing? All right. Well, first of all, you, uh, you're, you're going to see the late night shows uh, disappearing, or at least going into reruns. Saturday Night Live this week uh, is going to be a rerun. I suspect that, and I don't know because they haven't announced it yet, but the announcements of what the fall TV lineup is in broadcast will either be delayed or potentially canceled because they just don't know what they're going to be able to produce 
for for broadcast. It's hard to say otherwise because, in, again, in the streaming era, in, in an era where people do their own programming, there isn't um, uh, there there's stuff that's in the can, as it were, or there's stuff that's been on the shelf, and people can go back and binge. Everything I've ever written somewhere is out there somewhere, <laughs> and you can go rewatch that if you want. And uh, by the way, Pat, can you tell me who's going to win the presidential election? Since you've worked on The Simpsons, I just want to, you know, do you have a prediction? The Simpsons, the, yeah, The Simpsons takes no credit for Donald Trump. All right, and, fine. Uh, uh, so I don't know that they want to say. Again, you quickly. Yes, I just want to say also, too, it also affects the jobs that are outside of just being in L.A. and in New York. Here in Boston, we make movies. And if we aren't able to get writers to make the films, then we can't we can't hire producers and directors and PAs and set designers and people behind the camera. It's 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 a trickle down and it's a it's a, an effect that will um, that will reverberate for a very long time. Thank you to all of you for joining me. Where tri trickle down economy does work. Yeah. Patrick Verone, Narissa Williams Scott, and Dominic Patton, thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.